Hey guys, it's Danny. Today we're gonna talk about Angraecum orchids. I don't feature these orchids enough. Well, that's because I don't have anything interesting to say, really, or anything worth making a video about. I only have two Angraecums. I used to have three. One was sadly lost. I'll talk about him as well. So today we're gonna make an update on my Angraecums, see how they're doing, and talk about the developments, and also maybe touch points with some other aspects of growing orchids, growing Angraecums, and so on, that might prove to be useful. Alrighty, so here we have the Angraecum sescapidale. I have this orchid for about two, actually, it might be three years already. Uh, it never bloomed for me, I have to say. I also kind of mistreated him. If I'm not mistaken, initially he was spotted in the orchid focus mix, which proved to be quite detrimental for my orchids, the old orchid focus mix. Nowadays, they might have changed the formula. I hope they did. Anyway, and this is the Angraecum Vici that I received uh, last summer, at the beginning of summer, from one of my lovely viewers, and isn't he a beauty? I used to have the Angraecum Magdalene as well, which I received from a friend as a seedling. Sadly, it developed crown rot, or actually I induced crown rot onto it because I was trying to get rid of spider mites, and of course whatever water goes into a crown, no matter if it contains insecticides or things of the sorts, it's still water and it still has the possibility to induce crown rot, stem rot and things of the sorts. On a later autopsy, let's call it like that on the orchid, I discovered it did contact Fusarium and even though it tried to produce a basal kiki, it failed. It didn't have enough energy, the leaves started to rot, there was a multitude of things going on with him, so sadly I managed to kill it. But I do have these ones. So let's get to the update part. The sescapidale is not necessarily doing much, but it is growing and it started finally to produce normal leaves. As you can see, in the past, there has been some sort of damage on it and it lost quite a few leaves at the base here because, well, that's what an uncontrolled spider mite outbreak can do to an orchid. So pretty much the older part of the orchid is not looking all that great, but the newer part is starting to look very, very well and the leaves have started to grow normal again, have a normal color, they don't have patches, don't have damages anymore. This is a little, it's not a cakey, I used to believe it's a cakey, but then I repotted it, I separated it, it's a uh, different plant actually. And as you can see, the leaves grew tiny and now they're starting to grow quite large. You can see it in the back there. So this one is developing as well. I think it's a sort of another seedling orchid that just managed to get caught with the bigger orchid and then somebody repotted them all together and that's that. So practically I have two plants here. This is not a cakey, but I decided to pot them together. So I have them both in one place. Things are starting to return to normal, but I don't see any flower spikes just yet. This one is supposed to bloom in the winter. It didn't, winter is almost gone so I'm not expecting much. However, this one, well this one has a little tragic history as well. At first I tried to keep it on my terrace in dappled light, the most dappled light I could and still he hated it and I have sunburns all over the place. Now this damage right here, I'm not entirely sure what type of damage it is, it was present there when I received it. In the stem, the lower part of the stem, I did have things of the sorts. They don't look like fungal infections or anything, they look like some sort of dry damage. They don't spread, they don't really do anything and it's just on the stem here, so who knows what type of damage this is, but it's not affecting the life of this orchid. So this orchid started to grow, as you can see, uh, the leaves are not as big as they used to be, the top leaves. But now they're growing bigger and bigger, so that is a good sign. I since, of course, moved it to the greenhouse in bright light, but no direct sunshine, and I controlled the temperature in my greenhouse, so things should theoretically be better for this guy. Now the developments. This orchid started to produce some roots. Um, they are aerial roots, they're starting from the base, I'm not sure what's going on in the pot, but I have suspicions that everything is okay in the pot, and I'll show you how I'm gonna test it. So these are the roots that are starting to grow, this is another root that grew, it went inside the medium, and I suspect she's growing quite well in the medium. So this is pretty much what Angraecums do, they start to produce roots from across the stem, just like a vanda, higher and higher, and at some point you will have a bunch of aerial roots just spidering around the pot and inside the pot and so on. But what's the best, best, best news with this orchid is that we also have a flower spike. Do you see that little green nub in there? That is not a root. And you can see when a root starts to form, it is very rounded, the tip is very rounded, practically pierces through the leaves. And this one has absolutely no round tip, it is in between the leaves, it is a flower spike. 
which is pretty awesome. This makes it the first flower spike of an Angraecum that I ever witnessed. Again, we have that type of damage that this orchid came with. It's not putting the life of the orchid in danger, it's just ugly, and that's that. Now about these orchids, well I have to say they've established very well in an organic medium. They're one of the orchids that I don't have a lot of issues with, remember yesterday's video? Yeah, these are not as fragile and I didn't really see any damage, but these orchids produce very thick roots, they're quite robust, let's call it like that. So actually they did very well in the clay pot in an organic medium as long as I kept them well watered. I discovered that Angraecums are thirstier than I thought. Now don't imagine Miltoniopsis thirsty or even Oncidium thirsty. It's an in-between. It's pretty easy to see why. They're big, they have big structures, they do need hydration. Now what happens when roots don't get hydrated? Well, this happens. Let me give you a close-up. You see, this root doesn't get all that much hydration because she is way high, quite on top of the medium. I don't get to water it too often, but I will start to put this orchid in the sink, get my osmosis water, and pretty much try to wet with the pump sprayer that I have everything because this root, as you can see, she needs hydration. So when it comes to aerial roots, they're not as good as fowls. So that's why I say these orchids are thirstier than I thought they would be. They're not extremely thirsty, but not quite as articles make them sound like. Other than that, as I was saying, they do very well in this inorganic medium and the way to know, and it's pretty hard to show you on camera, the way to know is by lifting them. Do you see this orchid is not coming out of her pot? Let's try with this one because it's not so, so, so heavy. Now, you know how they say a rule to know that your orchid is properly potted is to lift it up and it should lift with the pot. When you're dealing with clay pots and clay medium, don't do it. It shall never come together with the pot when you repot an orchid. So that rule, just, just don't forget about it. In plastic, it might happen, particularly if you manage to make the medium pretty tight, but in this setup, it's not gonna happen. You know when it's gonna happen? When the roots start to attach to the clay pot. And that's exactly what I tested here. All right, so yeah. The roots have attached to the pot and they're growing inside the pot and pretty much everything is okay as long as I was saying as I keep them quite well watered. I do let the medium dry out quite a bit but I don't keep them very very dry. So from this point of view with Angraecums I don't have the issues that I'm having with other orchids. When it comes to light for these orchids they do enjoy very bright light but I would not give them direct hot sunshine as you can see they can easily burn. They're not very, very tolerant. Not even Vandas in my climate are that tolerant. And other orchids that can withstand very bright light, be very careful with hot sun, they can get burned. They're not big fans of direct sunshine. But of course, if the sun is not very strong, let's say it's morning sun or late, late afternoon sun, it's perfect. Temperature-wise, they are extremely hardy. They can tolerate very hot temperatures as well as quite low temperatures. And in the nighttime right now, I do get 15 degrees. Okay, I keep my greenhouse at 17 most of the times, but sometimes in rare occasions when it's kind of cold outside, I do get about 15 degrees in my greenhouse. No issues, absolutely no issues. These are amazingly hardy when it comes to temperature. And to be honest, I've never had issues even in my older environment with very low temperatures. As growth rate, well, they don't grow all that fast ever since I received this guy. It produced one, two, and this is the third leaf. And it's almost been a year, nine months or so, or eight months. So they're not the fastest growers. And of course, in the winter time, they slowed down as well, but now spring is coming, so they started to pick up growth. So don't imagine that this big thing will be 20 meters long in about five years. No, it doesn't work like that. You do have some time to adjust to the situation. So even if you purchase a tall and gray come big and great come. It will not become a monster very, very soon, so that's a good thing. Fertilizer-wise, as I was saying, they're quite heavy feeders, so whatever I give to the cattleyas that have continuous growth and brassavolas and stuff of the sorts, this is what these guys get. The only orchids that get more fertilizer than these guys are the catacetums in their growing period, but no orchid actually receives the quantity of fertilizer that I give to the catacetums. Other than that, I do suspect that variations in temperature and seasons actually help them bloom. As I was saying, the sesquipedale usually blooms in winter. It benefits from a drop in temperature in the winter time. I suspect the vici as well, so they're not worm growing.
growers all year long, like maybe Vandazar. I think they do benefit from a little variation in temperature, but not a lot. Don't imagine from 30 degrees you go to 10 degrees, nothing of the sort. They don't have a rest period, they don't have a dormancy, but I just think a little variation helps them bloom since they are seasonal bloomers. They don't bloom throughout the year. The Angrecum sescapidale is actually called the Christmas orchid because it should be in bloom around Christmas. Well, in particular environments, because not all of our environments are the same, and I can tell you that proper winter for me comes in December, while in my older climate it's kind of started from October. Other than that, I don't find them fussy growers. They're quite easy to care for, and um, I don't think they're very, very, very hard to rebloom either. Of course, if you don't mistreat them, like I did this guy. But this guy, I don't know. I'm really hoping next year he will bloom. This year, I don't think he will. I think he needs more time to establish. So there is that. They're not the easiest bloomers. But if they are established and they like the environment and you don't stress them too much, they can bloom. And the Vichy will have some beautiful, fragrant at night flowers pretty soon, hopefully, if I don't manage to mess up the flower spike. So that's pretty much it on the Angrecums. It was long overdue this video. Many of you asked me to talk more about the Angrecums, but I have a thing. I don't like to talk about orchids until I have some results, some things that I see work, that I see are going okay. And this guy did not do all that great. It survived, it did okay, but it didn't do very, very, very well. It didn't bloom, so there was really nothing to talk about. I don't really like to make those types of videos. I like to make videos that actually show some progress, you know? If you are one of my viewers who did ask me about the Angrecums, here you go. Hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for suggesting it and thank you for waiting so long. So if you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you hated it, give it a thumbs down. Subscribe to my channel for daily orchids and plants videos and updates and experiments. And don't forget to turn on notifications so you never miss a video. And stay tuned for the outro because I'll make an update on yesterday's progress. And with that said, I'll see you guys next time. Bye! So it's been 24 hours since the experiment from yesterday and behold, no damage on the top root. There's another root right there, it has no damage. And also the El Hatilio Pinta, which receives tap water. I did water it again today because this thing is, it's horrible. Anyway, no damage as you can see on the root tip. So maybe the tap water is not my problem. I don't know, I hope it's not, but yeah, so far no damage. Of course, I will continue to water it with tap water and see how it does. It's a pretty much a long-term experiment, but yeah, I can conclude now that I might have seriously messed up with the Victoria Regine and with choosing those rocks and bleach and so on. So that's a real possibility at this point.